All right, so welcome to Random Stuff number two. And our goal today is to figure out how to use the I.O. ports on 8051 family devices correctly. And um, the 8051 devices have quasi-bidirectional I.O. ports, and we'll explore the consequences of that in a moment. And uh, the main thing we have to take care about is if we want to use a port for both input and output. Uh, as we did in the previous video, and if you watch that video, you can see that I ran into some uh, unexpected behavior. And in this video, we'll figure out what was going on and figure out how to uh, fix the problem. And uh, to make a long story short, use the 8051 bit access instructions. Um, basically, if you're using an 8051 port for both input and output, you have to be very careful when you generate output not to mess up the pins that are being used as inputs, and we'll see why uh, as we go on. And the upshot is that um, programming the 8051 devices is a bit different than the AVR devices. So if you are more familiar with uh, AVR devices, I mean, that's the microcontroller family that I'm the most familiar with, um, then the 8051 programming model is a bit different. So this video is intended to show you how and show you how to use the 8051 correctly. Okay, let's get started. All right, so before we actually get started, uh, let me say thank you to user Rick100, who explained to me why my code in the last video wasn't working and helped me understand how IO works on the 8051. So thank you, Rick. All right, so let's talk about digital I.O. on microcontrollers. And there are some basic ideas um, that we should mention. So uh, one idea is that microcontrollers have ports, and a port is simply a group of digital I.O. pins, um, typically um, eight digital I.O. pins. Um, and with each port, uh, there is associated one or more port registers uh, that the program, the firmware program, can use to read or write uh, the individual pins in that port. And the important idea here is that for the register values, each bit in the register value corresponds to one of the pins that is part of the port. And if you are uh, outputting to the port, so if you are writing a value to the port, the idea is that if a bit is zero, a low voltage is produced on the corresponding pin. And if you write a one, a high voltage is produced on the corresponding pin. And then if you are reading from uh, the port register, then you can examine the bits in the value that you read. Uh, if a low voltage was on the pin, uh, the corresponding bit is a zero, and if a high voltage was on the pin, the corresponding uh, bit is a one. Um, so there is one issue that arises when you use uh, a port register to write data, to output data to the pins associated with the port, uh, which is that in general, uh, we want to be able to change just one pin, meaning we want to change just one bit in the register. Uh, so how exactly do you do that? So let's talk about uh, what code to uh, output to a uh, digital I.O. port would look like. All right, so here is how we can change a single bit of a register in C. And the basic idea is that we will shift a one into an, the appropriate position within the value that we want to change in the register. So for example, if we want to output a value to pin two of an output port, and we're, we're presuming that um, bit two in the register associated with that port uh, controls that pin. Basically, we'll take a one, so that is a one bit in position zero. If we shift it two positions to the left, now the one bit is in position two, um, meaning that we have a one in exactly uh, the spot corresponding to pin two within that register. And then we can use bitwise operators to uh, read the current value of the register, uh, modify the value, and then write a new value back to the register and we this uh, read modify write uh, should basically change just one bit and uh, there are these very standard idioms for changing a single bit if we want to set a bit meaning we want the bit to be one we take the current value of the register and do a bitwise or with our bit value and that will essentially unconditionally turn on 
that one bit value and leave all the other bits exactly as they were. If we want to clear a bit value, uh, we take the current value of the register and do a bitwise AND with the complement, meaning the inverse of the bit that we want to change. And essentially that unconditionally puts a zero into that bit and leaves the other bits the way that they were. Okay, so let's see if this actually works if we try it in a firmware program. All right, so here's a very simple test program for the ATtiny2313 microcontroller. That is an AVR microcontroller. And uh, the way the circuit is set up is that there is an LED uh, connected to uh, pin zero of port V. And then there is a push button switch connected to pin one of port D. And uh, when the program starts, uh, we set the data direction register so that there's a one in every bit um, except for uh, the bit corresponding to the switch. So that basically sets the switch as an input. Uh, we write one bit to uh, port D uh, output register, and that uh, sort of sends a one um, on each output and also enables an internal pull-up resistor on the pin that we have our switch connected to. And then the program repeatedly um, pulls the, uh, the input register for the port, uh, checking to see if the bit corresponding to the switch is set. If it is, uh, it writes a one uh, to the bit corresponding to the LED. That's going to turn the LED off because the LED's cathode is connected to the pin, so current will only flow uh, when we uh, output a low voltage on the output pin. So if uh, the, the switch bit is not set, that means that the switch is being pressed and pulled to pulling the input pin to ground, and then we'll set a zero in the corresponding uh, bit for the pin that the LED is connected to, and that will turn the LED on. So basically, when we press the button, the LED should turn on. So let's see if it works. All right, so here's the circuit with the ATtiny 2313. We press the button, LED comes on, we release the button, LED goes off. So it works. All right, so here is a similar program for uh, 8051 microcontrollers that we'll try on uh, several different parts. And um, we're going to use um, port 3 uh, for our digital I.O. And um, pin 3 is going to drive the LED. We'll connect the cathode of the LED to pin 3. And then uh, the switch is connected to pin 2 of, of port 3. So the way the program works is we start by writing all 1 bits to port 3. Uh, that is necessary if you want to use any of the pins as uh, inputs. Uh, we repeatedly pull port 3 to see if the um, bit corresponding to the switch is set. If it is set, that means the button's not being pressed. So we uh, write a one bit to the LED pin and that sets a high voltage and that uh, turns the LED off. Uh, otherwise, if uh, the switch bit is not set, then we clear the bit corresponding to the LED and that should turn uh, the LED on. So if you are thinking carefully about what this program does, uh, you should see a problem with it. But anyway, let's see how it behaves in an actual circuit. All right, so here's our test circuit with the uh, 89C2051 microcontroller. And uh, when I press the button, the LED comes on, and that's good. But when I release the button, the LED stays on. And what that suggests is that the input pin that the switch is connected to is not detecting that releasing the pin uh, returns that node of the circuit to a high logic level. And I even do have a, a pull-up resistor at that node in the circuit. So uh, obviously something's not working here. One potential explanation is uh, this particular part, uh, I think I got from eBay or AliExpress or one of those places, and you, and you never quite know the origin of parts when you get them uh, in that way. And so maybe the the, maybe the chip is just bad. So uh, let's try it with a known good part that I ordered from DigiKey. All right, so here's the same experiment, this time with an 89C2051 that I ordered from DigiKey, which is uh, a very reputable distributor. And so I press, LED comes on, release, LED stays on. So same exact behavior. So maybe there's something special about these Atmel parts that's different than uh, a genuine 8051. So let's, let's try it with a, an actual 8051 family part. All right, so here's the circuit with an actual ADC 
32 device, and it's running from an external 8K EE prom device. Uh, the schematic for the circuit is in the uh, GitHub project that's linked from the description. So uh, if I press the button, LED does indeed come on. If I release the button, LED stays on. So uh, maybe it's something about the fact that this is a CMOS part and not one of the original uh, non-CMOS parts. So let's, let's put an actual Intel uh, 8031 in there and see what happens. All right, so here is the same circuit with an actual Intel 8031 device in it. And I'll press the button, LED comes on, release the button, LED stays on. And at this point, I think we can say somewhat conclusively that there is something fundamentally wrong with the way that we are uh, either reading the input or controlling the LED. So uh, let's now investigate what exactly we're doing wrong. All right, so here's what the problem with our 8051 code was. So um, the, one of the big differences between the AVRs and the 8051s is that on the 8051 parts, uh, each IO port appears only as a single register to the firmware. And uh, in order to treat a particular I.O. pin as uh, an input, if we want to read uh, a digital value from an input pin, uh, the bit in the corresponding register must be high. It must be a 1. Uh, and if you consider the code we were using to read the switch and then toggle the LED, we were checking to see if whether or not that uh, input bit was set. Um, and if it was set, that means the switch wasn't pressed and we just sort of wrote, um, you know, uh, a one to the LED bit and preserved the one that was in the uh, input bit. Uh, and, you know, nothing inherently problematic there. The problem occurs uh, when we discover that the switch is pressed and our input pin has gone low. Um, this idiom of uh, updating the port uh, register to uh, be bitwise anded with the complement of the LED bit in order to force the LED pin low. Um, if you think about when this happens, uh, the, the pin that the switch is connected to is low at the point that we're executing this statement. And that means that we will wind up, you know, because this is a read, modify, write operation, we're going to wind up writing a zero into the uh, uh, bit in the register that corresponds to that input pin. And the moment that that uh, input bit goes to zero, uh, we cannot read that pin again. And, and so that is our problem, is that we're storing a zero into the bit that corresponds to our switch input. Uh, and because it becomes zero, uh, it essentially gets stuck there. And we can actually observe that in the circuit. All right, so here is our problematic 89C2051 circuit again. And um, we, one experiment we can do is if we test the, uh, the voltage on pin 6 of the microcontroller, which is the one that the switch is connected to, um, currently it's at a high level. Um, and that is uh, because there's a pull-up resistor here that's you know, pulling that node of the circuit up to uh, the logic high. Uh, when I press the button, that's going to um, pull that node of the circuit down to ground. It's creating a path to ground um, through the switch. Uh, and then the LED comes on. Um, the reason that the LED stays on is that we're continuing to read a low voltage on that pin. Uh, and essentially, if we, uh, again, measure the voltage on pin 6, We'll notice that now it is a low voltage. And essentially what happened is that when the buggy firmware wrote a zero to the bit corresponding to the pin the switch is connected to, uh, it essentially caused the microcontroller to drive that node of the circuit down to ground. It's now actively outputting a low voltage uh, on that node of the circuit. And uh, any subsequent reads um, you know, to, that, uh, to that pin are also going to see a zero. So, so that's basically why uh, the LED stays on. Okay, so now let's talk about how we can fix that problem in the firmware. All right, so to do robust digital I.O. on the 8051, essentially what we want to try to do is avoid accessing uh, bits unnecessarily, and we certainly don't want to modify bits that are uh, that correspond to pins that we are using as an input. Because if we write a zero there, uh, the input is going to stop working. So the 8051 family gives us this interesting capability, which is the ability to address 
individual bits in uh, certain registers and memory locations um, in the uh, 8051 address space. And our compiler, SDCC, uh, has a special data type called underscore underscore bit that essentially corresponds to these addressable single bit locations and conveniently provides us um, basically names that we can use to refer to these individual one bit locations so that we can access them atomically in a way that doesn't change other bits. And so that uh, leads us to a uh, improved version of the program where uh, we work with our LED and our switch by actually accessing the bit variables corresponding to those pins. And that makes our program actually quite simple. Uh, we set all the pins in port three to one as we did before. Uh, we can now check the switch bit directly to see if it's a one or a zero. Um, if it's a one, that means the button's not pressed and we uh, set the LED bit, the digital output controlling the LED to one and that turns the LED off. Uh, otherwise, if the switch bit is zero, meaning that we read uh, a low voltage on uh, the switch input, meaning that it was pressed, then we set the LED bit uh, to zero and that turns the LED LED on, and um, let's see if this program works. All right, so let's see if the program works. So we press, let LED goes on, release, LED goes off. Okay, that works. Let's make sure it works with the DigiKey 89C 2051. All right, so here's the DigiKey 89C 2051. Uh, that one works as well. Let's try it with the ADC32 and the AD31. All right, so here's the circuit with the ADC32, and that works. Let's try the AD31. All right, so here's the genuine Intel AD31. That one works as well. Let's take a quick look at the assembly code that's generated by SDCC for the fixed firmware program. And basically the thing to notice is that for the lines of code where one of the port three bits is accessed, the compiler is generating specific uh, assembly language instructions that access individual bits. So for example, for the uh, condition on um, the bit that the switch is connected to, there is a J and B instruction, basically conditional jump if a bit is zero, testing uh, pin two of port three. Uh, and then for the two lines of code where we are assigning either a one or a zero to the bit that is driving the LED, the compiler is generating either the set B or clear instructions, and each of those accesses uh, just the bit that we want to toggle. So essentially, this is what we want uh, to see in the generated code, is that the instructions that access individual bits are being generated, and that way we know that we're not disturbing the state of bits that shouldn't be modified. All right, so this is a good place to wrap up. And essentially what we learned is that the digital IO pins on the 8051 devices work differently than on AVR devices. Code for AVR devices isn't, isn't necessarily going to translate directly to the 8051 because of the 8051's quasi bi-directional uh, uh, IO ports, uh, but that's not a big deal. We can work around that using the individual bit access instructions at the assembly language, and we can take advantage of SDCC's underscore underscore bit data type to access IO pins in isolation and avoid the type of problem that we described in the video. Uh, one consideration to think about is that um, I believe in some situations uh, outputs on the 8051 devices may require uh, external pull-up resistors, so uh, they are, my understanding is that they are open collector outputs. And when you have an open collector output, it needs a pull-up resistor to pull the output high unless the output is actively being driven down. And I think the 8051 devices do have internal pull-up resistors, but they are very weak ones, which uh, may not be strong enough to drive uh, certain kinds of inputs. Uh, personally, I've had no trouble using 8051 devices to drive CMOS inputs, but it is something to uh, consider. Um, okay, so that's it for this video. See you in the next video.